Today we examine the importance of the man of sin that's spoken about in 2 Thessalonians, the letter that was written by Paul to the church at Thessalonica, that that man of sin should be revealed, should be manifested, who he is, who is the man of sin. We spoke about in the last teaching concerning the Antichrist, which is really uh, works in conjunction with the man of sin. Really, these are synonymous terms, uh, can be interchangeable. We won't go into all the doctrine and the arguments for or against that, but we can see clearly that the man of sin, the Antichrist, he who opposes Christ, he who makes himself to be God, should not be hard to discern who that one is should be quite easy for all of us. However, the truth of the matter is, he's been hidden. The man of sin has to be revealed. Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians that this man of sin must first appear and then we will see the manifestation or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we will see the manifestation of the day, that day being a person. So he says, because he was answering those who he was afraid we're being deceived by a doctrine that was saying the day of the Lord had already come or the full manifestation, the coming of the Lord in his full glory of appearing had already taken place. So Paul correcting that says, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. That's important. Showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, that is the man of sin, that is the son of perdition, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, the coming of the lawless one who is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So if we examine this man of sin and look very closely, the Antichrist, the man of sin, he who opposes Christ, who actually takes the position of Christ, takes the position of the king. What does the scripture say concerning the man of sin? Each of us, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were all conceived in sin, in iniquity. Uh, we were birthed into the world, born of our first lineage according to the flesh, to our natural human parents. All of us sinned by nature. It wasn't something anybody had to teach us. It was a nature resident in our human heart. We can confirm these things by scripture, and yet there's going to be those who argue against the truth. I've heard doctrines such as there was no sin in the beginning. This all is deception. That's the truth of the matter. And for those that are open to the word of the Lord, I want to look at these few scriptures speaking of the man of sin, whom we all know very well, because we live with him. He is within our own heart, within our own mind. And he is the one who we are learning through the power of Christ to resist, to overcome. If we look at Psalms chapter 51, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. But notice, the psalmist says, I was brought forth in iniquity. 
and in sin my mother conceived me. And again, Paul, writing to the Romans, says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he also writes, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So you're seeing a theme here that none of us should be able to argue away the fact that we were conceived in sin according to our first nature. John also writes of this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So this should make very clear to us who the man of sin is that Paul was writing about to the church at Thessalonica. And it is very easy for all of us, as with the Antichrist, to find a scapegoat, someone that we can blame, that we can pin the badge on that says, this is the man of sin. This out here, one of these evil men, evil dictators, a past uh, Caesar, someone else other than myself fits that man of sin, that son of perdition. And we can find that in evil rulers and dictators. We see many people that can exemplify a man of sin, one who is given over into iniquity. However, we have to reckon with the fact that all of us, each one, were conceived in sin, as was the psalmist. And all of us fall short of the glory of God. And we cannot lie to ourselves and say that we have no sin. Now, when we are redeemed and bought and purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus and he washes us clean from sin and he covers us, first of all, by grace, we're covered by the blood of the lamb and he no longer imputes our sins or holds our sin against us. And we have what is considered to be imputed righteousness. He says, you are righteous because of the Son of God because Jesus died for you and he covered you, he washed you. But we still have a temptation in us to not believe God's word and everything that is of unbelief, that is the root of sin, of missing of the mark, of falling short of the righteousness of God. So we look at these scriptures first so that we can Stop looking for somebody else or something else or some other entity, some other spirit, some other devil, some other person to put the blame on or to title the man of sin. This happens also with those things that pertain to that that name that has been given to the day star that they call Lucifer. Now, if we keep an open mind and allow the spirit of the Lord to teach us rather than tradition, rather than what is considered common knowledge in the large theological institutions where most of the nominal or uh, church world pastors and teachers are taught and where they receive their doctrine from, we, we, it will do us a great service to allow the Lord to teach us and correct us if we're off. Thank God that none of us have perfect understanding. I don't claim to have perfect understanding, but I am desiring the truth. I am desiring to know the Lord in his fullness. And as we're finding out here in 2 Thessalonians, there is an opposer that has to be revealed. Who is that opposer? Who is that man of sin? Who is that Lucifer to use this language or that Antichrist? That one who was a shining one who now has been lowered or fallen from his position. Who is that one? If we look at Adam in the garden, and again, keeping an open mind, we will see that he actually was created of God as a shining one, as a light. Did Jesus not say that you are the light of the world? Now you're the light of the world because you've received Christ, who is the light that comes into the world to light every man. But Adam was made in God's image and likeness. And God is light. Let us examine some scriptures that prove this point. That Adam being created in God's image, God being light himself, our God has no darkness in him at all. 
but is the God of light. And in the beginning he spoke, let there be light, and there was light. And where did that light come from? It came right out of the midst of God himself. He didn't use nothingness to create the creation, but he actually created everything that's seen now out of himself. And so when he created it, he said it was good. It was good because it came out of God and God is light and in him is no darkness. So if he created man in his own image and likeness, he created him as a shining one, as a light who was to have dominion over the earth. Now this was the first man, Adam, who was created. And Paul again writes about this in 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. This gives the contrast of the two men, two men being in the world, the first man, Adam, and the last Adam, or the life-giving spirit. He says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. He's the one that was created from the dust of the earth. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. He is the one that was born of a virgin, filled completely the fullness of God bodily. One brought death to the world. One brings life to the world. One brought sin and the curse to the world. The other brings redemption and everlasting life and glory to the world. So, he says in verse 46, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, in what way do we bear the image of the man of dust, of the first man, Adam? First and foremost, as Adam sinned in the garden, so we also sin by nature. And God, Paul again writes about, subjected the whole creation to this vanity. He allowed Adam to be tempted and God had full knowledge, predetermined knowledge that Adam through his soul, Eve, would fall into temptation and therefore would be lowered into a, into a existence of sin and death for a season, for time. He subjected that man in hope, the hope of resurrection out of death, the hope of being enlightened by the Spirit of God through faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as Adam has sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we bear that image according to the natural birth that we have through the lineage of Adam, just as we will bear the image and are bearing the image of the second man, the second Adam, the Lord from heaven, the life-giving spirit through new birth in him, in Jesus Christ. Oh, what marvelous news. And yet we have to recognize who this man of sin is. Now remember, Adam, the first man, was actually still made to be God's shining one. Though for a season, he was lowered to a realm of darkness, he still was created in the image of God. And God is light. First John declares this. This is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we thank God for the truth that's written of in Habakkuk. That the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that knowledge is light. Every time light is written of or spoken of by the Spirit, it is speaking of the knowledge of the Lord. The knowledge of the Lord is light. And then we see in Genesis, the first chapter, God said, let us make man in our image. And if God is light, he makes a man of light. According to our likeness, he said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over all creeping things that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And that dominion, that knowledge and wisdom that it takes for Adam 
to rule over the earth came from God. It was the knowledge of God. However, Adam was tempted. He had the knowledge of God. He walked with God, but he was immature. He had not yet been tested or proven. And God allows his sons, his children, to be proven, to go through a test, a trial that will actually, in the end, strengthen them. Though they may be broken down for a season, they are only broken down that they might be built back up in greater strength and glory and honor through his way. And who is his way? Jesus Christ is the way. Amen. And we find in him the righteousness, the strength, the victory that the first Adam did not have in his untested state. But thank God that we now have that through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, the first man, Adam, when he was tempted, though he was made as a shining one in the earth, the one that had dominion, the one that was created, God in all of his creation didn't create any other being or thing in his image as he did with Adam. But with Adam, Adam was the likeness of God. And as God is light, so Adam was to, made to be a shining one. So again, if we look back at this scripture in Isaiah 14, the 12th verse, armed with that understanding, and we look here in the Young's Literal, it says, How hast thou fallen from the heavens, O shining one, son of the dawn? And think, this is the first man that was born. He was the son of a new creation, of a new being of light. And yet he says, thou hast been cut down to the earth. O weakener of the nations. And thou settest in thine heart, the heavens, I go up above stars of God. I raise my throne. This is the temptation that came to Adam. And it is, it works perfectly in conjunction with the man of sin wrote, written of in second Thessalonians, the second chapter, the third verse, who usurps God's throne. Paul writing again says, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So you see the similarities of these two scriptures in Isaiah 14 and in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. And if we go back again to the third verse, yes, if we look at it from a historical aspect or from the historical position, yes, that this scripture is speaking of the king of Babylon. Again, in the third verse, it says, it shall come to pass in the days or in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve, that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased. The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepters of the rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Well, this happened in a historical sense that Babylon was humbled by another nation. And this is always how God works through the course of time with nations. He raises up one and then he puts them down as he raises up another nation. And we see this clear into our day that there's one kingdom, one government that's exalted. And that comes by God's knowledge, foreknowledge and his plan and his purpose. And then he brings another nation and he humbles the one that was exalted. And so he did that with Babylon and with the king of Babylon. However, this is speaking of a more spiritually significant truth. That Adam was the one that was the king, the ruler over the earth. According to God's ordained plan, man was to be the one in dominion over the earth. And God had to lower man. Why? Because man through ignorance and pride was tempted to exalt himself above God. This is what the king of Babylon did. Look at Nebuchadnezzar as an example. He looked out over his kingdom, it's written about in Daniel, and he saw himself as the captain 
and the leader of his own heart, his own mind, and it was all because of his own wisdom and strength that he was able to accomplish these great things and have such a great and mighty kingdom. And so he gave glory and honor to himself rather than giving glory and honor unto God who had given him all of these things. And this is the same temptation that came to Adam. And as Nebuchadnezzar was lowered and became as a beast of the field uh, and lost his wisdom and his great understanding that he had that had made him king, such a great king, all that came through God, so Adam was lowered. And it was pride. Amen. And that's what we see in this shining one. And furthermore, in verse 6 it says, He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted. That is a picture again of the first man, Adam. And he has come down from his high and lofty position. It says in verse 10, They all shall speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed in instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and the worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O shining one, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. And how did Adam weaken the nations? Through sin, through disobedience. He was brought down. He said in his heart he would ascend into heaven and would exalt his throne above God. But he was brought down to Sheol, to a, separ a place of separation, into death. In the day that you eat of this tree, Adam, of the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. And we see that there in Genesis 3, 4. The serpent said to the woman with a deceptive voice, with a deceptive inclination, you will not surely die. For, your, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that is this temptation that Adam received that caused him to say in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought to the lowest, to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Notice, I will be like the Most High. That was the deception that came to Adam. And that's why he was told by the deceiver, you will be as God. In the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. And if we go back again to what Paul wrote of here, we see that th these three scriptures all work in conjunction with one another. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And a lot of people have this understanding that it's the Antichrist, some literal person. Uh, and it is literal people because it's inside of every human being, all of the literal people of the earth, all of those that have ever been born of the lineage of Adam. But they're thinking about a single entity, a singular person, like the Pope or like Hitler or some other great dictator whether it be historical, present, or future, that they're going to sit in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and deceive the people into thinking that they are God. But they're not keeping things in the context of the Spirit and how the Spirit is speaking to us. The kingdom of God is within you, brother, sisters. The kingdom of God is is not going to be built out where you can see it. The kingdom of God does not come with observation, Jesus said, but the kingdom of God is now within you. So the temple of God, that literal temple, physical temple, was destroyed in 70 AD, and they're not going to rebuild that temple. Jesus said, tear this temple down, and in three days, I'll rebuild it. And they thought he was crazy because they thought he was talking about that physical temple. But he was talking about his body. And Jesus raised from the dead on the third day, incorruptible, immortal, unable to ever die again. And now through the indwelling spirit, we have become 
the body of Christ. All of those who call on the name of the Lord in truth are a part of his body. And he now indwells us as the true temple of the living God. So who is this one, this man of sin, who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God? It's none other than that first man, Adam, in the spirit of that man, who is to be put to death by the cross and raised incorruptible in the spirit. But as much as he can live in us and declare himself to be king, lord, ruler, God of our life, that is where the deception lies. And it's in each and every heart. Every man, woman, and child has to resist that king, that false god, that mind of fallen flesh. We must resist him. Amen. He speaks with the same voice of Satan. And I'm not saying that that is Satan. Okay? I'm not saying, but Satan is the opposer. And remember that Jesus said, get the behind me, get behind me, Satan. And he was not speaking to a devil other than his own disciple, Peter, who was opposing Jesus, who had become a stumbling block, an offense unto the Lord because he was getting in the way of God's plan. And anything in us that gets in the way of God's perfect plan and order, whereby we humble ourselves and submit to the mind of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, he must be revealed for who he is so that he can be consumed and taken out of the way. We cannot rise up into the position of a full manifested son of God through the Lord Jesus Christ until this one who opposes and exalts himself above God and sits in the temple as God, until this one is revealed, until that which is restraining him is taken out of the way. And what restrains him? Our own deceptive heart. Even the religious orders that try to make him some external entity, some external man. Brothers and sisters, let us deal with this man of sin that was with, which is within each and every one of our own hearts. This is the mystery of lawlessness that's already working. And the carnal mind that restrains him, that keeps him hidden, that makes him some figment of our imagination externally, has to be removed and taken out of the way. And then, Paul writes in the eighth verse there, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. Praise God. That's what we're speaking today. The spiritual life of the Lord that will consume this adversary within each and every one of our hearts at the brightness of his coming, this one will be destroyed. This one who is lawless, without law, without righteousness, the one that was spoken of in the beginning, the one that we were conceived in, that one that is sin that Paul said over in Romans 7, I desire to do what's right, but I find another one in me, sin. And he calls him a man of sin. Or that's what's spoken of here. This one that I wrestle with, not with flesh and blood, but with these principalities and powers that are in high places in our own mind. They have to be put underfoot. They have to be destroyed by the brightness of his coming as he comes to be glorified in his temple, in his saints. Praise God. As the Lord raises up in our temple with the fire of his appearing, with the fire of his presence, he consumes every thought that's not of God, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. And he's destroyed by the brightness of of the coming of the Lord. This one who works in accord with Satan, the opposer, with false powers and signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteousness and deception among those who perish. Why? Why do they perish? Because they perish in their misunderstanding, in their, what is it? The scripture says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, not intellectual knowledge, knowledge of the king. Knowledge of his spirit, knowledge of his anointing. You have an anointing that teaches you, beloved. And you have no need of anyone else to teach you. In other words, you don't have to have another man, a sinful man at that. And no, he disguises himself as an angel of light. He, he shows himself to be a friend and not an enemy. To be a great instructor, 
This is what happens when men take the place of God, take the place and the position of the Lord and sit in his throne and usurp his position as our shepherd, his position as the bishop of our soul, his position as the chief apostle. This is what happens through men's systems and organizations. So we have to humble ourselves continually and we have to come to the place where we receive Jesus himself as Lord and his spirit and no other spirit. And God gives us discernment so that as this one is being revealed, he can be consumed by the spirit of the mouth of the Lord. Praise God. Be blessed. We look forward to continuing in the truth of God's word and in the anointing, his presence, his fire that consumes all things that are not of God.